morning, everybody. Um, on behalf of Centon Foundation and Ocean Nexus Center, thank you for being here with us today. On our chat, where we're going to talk about an equitable approach to marine plastic pollution. And we'll also present and talk about the Ocean Nexus Equity in Marine Plastic Report. Um, I'm going to take you through a brief introduction of the center. Um, and then we are going to patch in some of our panelists or speakers today uh, to talk about the intellectual foundation of the center, provide a brief overview of the report, and then we're going to talk about two perspectives or local examples of marine plastic pollution at different scales. Uh, my name is Ricardo de Casa. I'm going to be moderating today. I'm on the Foundation Ocean Nexus Fellow based out of Oregon State University. Later on, you'll hear from Dr. Yoshitaka Ota, the Devon Foundation Ocean Nexus Center Director. Later on, Dr. Jessica Vandenberg is going to give you a brief overview of the Marine Plastic Pollution Report, also a Nexus Fellow, followed by Dr. Cinda Scott another fellow with us, and also the director of the School for Field Studies at Bocas del Toro, Panama. And uh, finally, we will hear from Dr. Masanori Kobayashi, senior research fellow from the Ocean Policy and Research Institute of the Sasakawa Peace Foundation in Japan. Um, if you haven't seen our report, you can quickly uh, scan that QR code right now. If not, we'll make it available later on for everybody. Um, so we can move on. Yeah, we can skip this slide, please. So at Ocean Nexus, our mission is to establish social equity at the center of ocean governance. Our members are over 100 diverse group of international interdisciplinary scholars and practitioners. We function on an annual budget of $3.2 million under a 10-year commitment of the Nippon Foundation. Our program office is based out of the University of Washington at the Nippon Foundation Ocean Exit Center. And our partners include over 30 universities and civil society groups. And our deputy directors and chair professors are with partner institutes, including Simon Fraser University, Dalhousie University, University of Victoria, Edinburgh University and the Australian National Center for Ocean Resources and Security, among others. Nexus currently has 57 ongoing projects, 13 in development, and we completed 44. These projects are in a range of research topics, including the impacts and risks of marine interventions, seafood sovereignty, equity and justice in the blue economy. Coastal community well being and trapped boundary fisheries management. Nexus functions under four ocean equity principles. First, that we must recognize injustice and inequity that are central to current ocean issues through rigorous analyses and critical inquiries. We must recover people who are confronted with harm and failure to ocean governance structures and social systems by providing concrete forces of action. We must resist engagement with narratives that do not explicitly confront inequities. And we must reverse the systems that perpetuate equality and injustice by supporting disruptive actions and promoting shared leadership and networks. So now I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Yoshi Ota, director of uh, the Nexus Center, who is going to talk to us about the intellectual foundation of Ocean Nexus and uh, of Ocean Equity of the Nexus Center. Please, Yoshi, thanks. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, Yoshi. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be very quick because people just wonder why we're we talking about equity and what is this triangle before we go into marine plastic pollution, isn't it all about the plastic? So this is really the way we actually treat or address the plastic plastic issues. 
um, we understand there's inequity exists both in society and in ocean as an extension of the society. And then we now seeking for equitable ocean policy, which basically means let's really consider the people who be most affected by this enormous environmental change on a global scale, which is climate change, obviously. And then also pollution such as plastic, and we must not forget uh, new findings, uh, horrible stories about the PFAS and other uh, pollutants. And what we really thought about is, okay, what do we mean by equity? And the people trying to seek for the equitable approach. Shall we just take the equitable approach, stakeholder engagement, participation, and so on and so forth. But our approach is slightly or actually very different. We consider what we need to do is to dismantle inequity and inequity we see in society and also ocean governance. Um, so those inequities are something really difficult to talk about, such as racism, such as colonialism, such as misogyny and the intersectional discrimination. This is something we actually not accustomed to talk about in ocean governance or let's say marine conservation or any of the, the marine and the coastal management conversations. And people might say, well, I don't really want to talk about this. This is exactly the reason why I'm doing ocean and away from all this. But unfortunately, this is what it is. And this is what the ocean governance needs to tackle and this is what it takes to make equitable approach or equitable ocean policy. So same thing with money in plastic pollution, we really need to consider about how we can actually dismantle inequity that we see in the money in pollution, money in plastic pollution, and then therefore the policy must address and think about anti-inequity approach. I actually first got to discuss about marine plastic pollution with Nippon Foundation um, almost three and a half years ago. The issue of the marine plastic pollution was huge and it was just talk about this myth of huge garbage patch and island of the garbage or plastic in the middle of the oceans. Or um, we could actually create the bacteria if we eat the marine plastic and then we can solve everything. Or perhaps we could actually consider new materials instead of um, um, using the plastic, which we could really just um, use it as a biogradable. Those are actually, to some extent, it's true. But at the same time, for the sheer amount of the issues that we face, and we face it not middle of the ocean so far from us, but we face it right here on the land and right here on the coast, right here next to the river and upstreams. And it's just a fill of the plastics and then full of those rubbish and the people actually being deprived from their traditionally on the land, their livelihood. And unfortunately, the burden actually goes to the most vulnerable population in a society. I do actually know one of our colleagues actually created a documentary on the kids who are picking up money in plastic rubbish next to um, a tourist village um, and for three cents an hour. So that's the reality and that's what it is. And we really have to think about how we're we going to tackle with the issue, not just up somewhere, but to really to address the issues on the ground. So this is the start of the marine plastic pollution project. Me and a bunch of wonderful social and natural scientists work on this to see the impact of this marine plastic pollution and what it is that reality going on the ground. Impact is not some numbers up there. It's actually what people feel and face every day. And this is what's most important. It matters most in the ocean policies um, solutions when we design it and also okay so what's the approach we should take so that's what the central theme of the report and now I'm going to pass it to Dr. Ziska Pundeberg first also of this report uh, who's been a wonderful colleague of mine and really leading together with me um, for this project for the last two years um, the report has just been out there a couple of months ago and anybody can download it and we can have a look at it. And we are, um, if there's any question, we're happy to take it. So now I'm gonna uh, pass it to 
Dr. Vandenberg. Thank you, Jess. Thanks, uh, Yoshi. Um, so, Dr. Vandenberg, Jess, uh, take it away and uh, talk to us about the report and an equitable approach to marine plastic pollution. Sure, yeah. Uh, thank you, Yoshi, and thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction. Um, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and um, participate in this, this event at the Our Ocean Conference. Again, my name is Jessica Vandenberg, and um, I am a postdoctoral fellow with Ocean Nexus Center um, based out of University of Washington's School of Marine um, and Environmental Affairs. And as Yoshi said, I'm going to talk about the report today. Um, this has recently been published um, and I'm going to give uh, an overview of, um, of the content, um, including our overarching goals and research questions, our approach and framework, and the key actions that were leveraged from our research findings. So, um, this report is the result of original research carried out through collaboration with a diverse group of international interdisciplinary scholars and practitioners whose work center around equity and justice. And the project, um, like most of Ocean Nexus work, was funded through the Nippon Foundation um, and led by myself and Dr. Yoshi Oda uh, with the support of our amazing production team. Um, and I also just want to uh, recognize um, all of our contributing authors whose work are the foundation of our report. Um, and we're extremely grateful for all of their insightful contributions. Okay, so getting into the content, um, it's well recognized that marine plastic pollution is a global problem, yet it is less recognized that the burden of this issue is inequitably experienced. Marine plastics disproportionately impact coastal and island communities and communities that are highly dependent on marine resources for nutrition and their livelihoods. Uh, moreover, current governance solutions can perpetuate inequitable burdens due to their failures to consider the complexity and diversity of human plastic entanglements and the broader plastics life cycle. So the overall goal of this report um, was to unpack this equity problem. We wanted to further understand the impacts of marine plastic pollution and how they are inequitably experienced, how governance and management addresses or exacerbates inequitable impacts, and finally, how do we translate these findings into actionable items that contribute to socially equitable approaches for addressing marine plastic pollution. So first, I want to address how we're approaching the concept of equity. As Yoshi mentioned, um, we have this intellectual foundation, this triangle of um, sort of, of all the, um, the areas that we really want to ensure that we're highlighting of injustice and inequities. Um, but we also recognize that in governance and decision making, um, equity is often considered within these four domains of distributional, procedural, recognitional, and cultural and contextual equity, uh, where distributional refers to the distribution of costs, benefits, rights, responsibilities across groups and individual actors, Procedural equity refers to who is involved and included in decision-making processes. Recognitional equity refers to the acknowledgement, respect, and integration of diverse knowledge systems, values, social norms, and rights. And finally, cultural and contextual equity refers to uh, the meaningful consideration of the social governance, economic, historical, and cultural context in which governance processes are situated. So this framework, this was the basis of how we approach equity in the report, but we also acknowledge that equity issues are complex, they're diverse, and it can extend beyond and overlap between these categorical domains. So um, as I mentioned earlier, um, this report is the outcome of all the amazing work um, contributed by our many partners and collaborators from institutions across the globe who delved into equity issues related to their own research topics and disciplines. Uh, so the research is multidisciplinary, spanning ecological impacts and food web dynamics, 
human health and well-being, international, regional, and national policy and law, as well as field-based field studies assessing local perspectives on the impacts of marine plastic pollution and its governance. And this was um, this final point was a real central um, goal of the report. We really wanted to understand how communities most vulnerable to the impacts of marine plastics, um, how they experienced um, marine plastic pollution. So for example, um, some of the case studies that were highlighted in the report include Blair Cowfer's uh, work where she examined perceptions of responsibility and success among marine debris practitioners in Washington state and the United States. Uh, Carly McCollin's research that looked at the impacts of marine plastic pollution on mangrove dependent communities in Ecuador. Ivy Akuoko's work um, where she explored the impacts of marine plastics on coastal fishing communities in Ghana. Uh, in the Netherlands, Magdeld Vergu looked at fisher-led fishing for litter programs and their perceived position in addressing the marine plastic pollution problem. In Miyako, Japan, uh, Karen Otsuka Trudeau looked at the intersection of marine plastics, tourism and conservation, and how these external drivers interact and displace local people. And finally, in Aotearoa, um, New Zealand, Matt Perryman and Romilly Cumming uh, explored how indigenous Maori people uniquely experience marine plastic pollution and how plastic pollution is a form of waste colonialism. So um, based off of the major findings of these case studies and other contributed works, um, we use these to build out a thematic framework of emerging inequities um, related to marine plastic pollution, where we identified four major themes, the first being responsibility. And in this section, we explore how powerful industry actors have become influential in plastic waste governance and how this influence has impacted the ways in which governance actions are determined and who is deemed responsible for addressing the problem. The second section is knowledge. Um, in the section, we delve further into the role of powerful industry actors and how they have shaped mainstream environmental discourses and knowledge systems around plastic waste governance, while simultaneously systemically marginalized values and knowledge systems are excluded from these discourses and narratives. This third section is on well-being, where we explore the multitude of impacts experienced by communities who are most burdened by marine plastic pollution demonstrating the value of a more holistic impact assessment framework. And finally, the last section is on coordination. Um, and in this section, we discuss how fragmented and uncoordinated policies can lead to ongoing forms of waste colonialism and exploitation. So across each thematic section, we highlight key actions necessary for addressing processes that drive ongoing inequities in marine plastic pollution. So in the responsibility section, case studies illustrate how mitigative actions are often displaced onto end-of-life actors through the power and influence of big business. We describe how this is a strategic action by industry actors um, to prioritize governance approaches that are non-transformative and therefore do not limit economic growth and capitalist accumulation. We also discuss how responsibility scapegoats are created to dampen criticism of big business and shift blame from the plastics and petrochemical industries onto less powerful actors outside of their supply chain. And these findings highlight the need to refocus responsibility onto the root cause of the problem, which is the production of wasteful and toxic plastics and to recognize strategic actions powerful industry actors use to deflect responsibility. In the knowledge section, we examine um, specifically how industry has shaped the discourses defining the plastics, cr plastics crisis um, as an individualized problem of waste, deflecting attention away from the responsibilities of industry and distracting from the structural inequities of plastic waste burdens. We also describe how systemically marginalized knowledge systems have been excluded from the dominant discourses of plastic waste governance, which has led to environmental injustices experienced by global South and indigenous communities. 
And these findings emphasize how industry influence needs to be limited while indigenous and other systemically marginalized knowledge systems need to be recognized and uplifted to allow for more equitable and representative governance and management approaches. In the well-being section, we emphasize how a well-being approach contributes to more equitable modes of impact assessment that acknowledges the diversity of impacts, needs, and values that occur across different communities. So rather than focusing on socioeconomic impacts that are typical factors evaluated in ocean plastics impact assessments, we illustrate how marine plastics can influence other factors like an individual sense of place, mental health, food sovereignty, and cultural practices. Uh, we also examine how these impacts are often entangled with other systemic inequities um, and other historical, political, cultural, and social contexts. And these case studies illustrate that community voices need to be prioritized in understanding the range of impacts that stem from marine plastic pollution burdens. And in our final section, um, coordination, we illustrate how uncoordinated governance action and policies can produce ongoing displacement of plastic waste from high income to low income nations, perpetuating unequal plastic waste burdens. Uh, we also discuss how plastic production restrictions in one country have resulted in focused efforts by industry to increase production in countries that may not have the capacity to regulate production. So fragmented regulation produces these balloon effects where squeezing out plastic production in one country leads to inflation of production in others. So both in the case of production and waste management, there exist these inequitable global flows of plastics that leads to exploitation. So um, that was just a very quick overview of the content of the report. I do encourage if people are interested to um, take a look at the final version. Um, and also we're going to extended versions of all the case studies that are part of this report um, are going to be published in a forthcoming issue of Marine mm -hmm. on equity and justice in marine plastic pollution. And if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out. Um, and now I'm going to hand it back off to Yoshi, who's going to briefly touch on how we're leveraging the findings from this report to develop a roadmap on equitable governance approaches. Thank you. Thank you, Jess, for the comprehensive explanation of about report. Um, it's, so report itself is really to describe what the impact is and what are our considerations from critical perspectives. And we thought people are probably start talking about like, okay, it all sounds interesting, but how are we going to approach it? So we first uh, take a step and uh, gather uh, 20 colleagues uh, coming from NGOs, um, IGOs, and uh, diverse geography and expertise, and um, did a uh, roadmap exercise, uh, which took us about like six months. Uh, we are finalizing the roadmap, and it will actually come out in about a couple of months. So please do stay tuned. But we like to continue this effort of the roadmap. And if anybody is interested in, and we are hoping to recruit more people and keep working on this roadmap uh, this year, perhaps later. Um, so thank you very much, and stay tuned. And I also like to thank our moderator, Ricardo, who's doing a great job. So I'm passing back to Ricardo. Thank you, Jess. Back to you, Ricardo. Thank you, Yoshi, for appreciating the moderation. Um, <laughs> and thank you, Jess, for uh, your brief explanation of the report. Um, I was going to open it up for questions now, but I'd like to hold those till the end so we can also give our other speakers an opportunity to speak. And then at the end, you know, if you'd like to address any questions to them, we can do that too. Um, so we're going to go to some slides now for Dr. Sinha Scott's uh, chat. We'll come back to the QR code afterwards. So if any of you would like to download or check out that report, you can do so. Um, and Cinda is going to talk to us about experiences and perspectives with marine plastic pollutions in Bocas del Toro, which is right here 
in Panama. So it's more of a local perspective. Um, Cinda. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I just want to state before I begin, uh, I have lived and worked in Boca del Toro for the past nine years, almost. Um, I am not from Boca del Toro. So my perspectives, um, I hope you can appreciate that as someone who does not um, come from there originally, that um, these are perspectives that I have as a person from the United States living and working there. And uh, I just wanted to to state that. And yeah, so here's the first slide. So um, the issue of Boca del Toro, uh, I'm going to frame this with challenges, findings, and equity implications as it is outlined in the um, report that has recently been published. And um, I just give congratulations to everyone who has worked so hard to bring this out for publication because I think it's really important. While it's not my area of expertise, I have seen locally um, what is happening on the ground with waste and waste management in the region. So the challenge um, is definitely uh, rooted in tourism. And when you think about tourism, that too, in many cases, is rooted in coloniality. And that's something that is not often talked about, <laughs> particularly as it relates to waste. So um, I think there is great demand for Boca del Toro. Um, it is, and you can go to the next slide. Okay. But that's okay. Yeah. So there's great demand to go to Bogus, right? It's a paradise. Um, everyone wants to go to see the mangroves. Well, at least I do. I'm a marine biologist. I love mangroves. Okay, maybe you don't want to go to the mangroves, but you do want to see the coral reefs. <laughs> you do want to see sea grasses. Um, you want to see the wildlife. You want to go to the beaches and, and be. And we have great demand from people from the global north, particularly from Canada, United States, and Europe. Um, who over COVID realized, I'm not so happy where I am. I'm going to go to paradise. And we have been seeing a huge influx of foreigners since COVID um, coming into Bogus, buying a property, and not having any idea of the culture, of the history, and of the people and the systems that are there. So they arrive and they think that their trash is going to be picked up regularly. The system is not designed that way. The system is you need to pay $1.50 to $2 per bag. It's not included in your taxes. And a lot of people aren't actually even paying taxes. So the system is not designed in the same way as where a lot of these people are uh, coming from. So they arrive and they want the same things that they have at home. And then comes the plastic. And then comes the box. Models. And then um, all of the things from Price Mart, which is Costco, <laughs> here. And um, I, I'm no different, right? I, I run a center and we have demands for our students to be able to live and do research. Um, and, and that's problematic. And so this is a great inequity. And those inequities are also along um, racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic lines. And um, so that brings me to, oh, and I should mention, there is a lot of displacement as well, particularly of indigenous Nobe in the region, which is even worse than when I arrived because of the increase of people coming into the region buying a property. And currently there are many people buying properties with multiple titles. So people who saved their entire lives and their retirement are giving their money over to land speculators and others who take their money and say, this is the title for your land, and then they disappear. And then you're left with a title along with four other people who have a title to a property. And all the while you are displacing a Nobe family who has rights of possession to that land for the last 25 years. Um, and I bring this up because this is happening next door to our next door neighbor's family. And they're about to be displaced because of multiple people saying that they own that property. Now, why is displacement important for marine plastics? <laughs> well, when people are displaced and they have nowhere to go, and it costs $2 a bag to throw away your waste, and it costs, um, you know, the minimum wage for a domestic worker, for example, in Panama is about $3.25 per hour. 
And in Bocas, you can see that some people are even being paid less than that at $2.50. So throwing away a bag of trash in and of itself is an inequitable process. And um, at the root of that is this demand and pressure for tourism to come to Paris. So findings. Um, I think Vanessa just mentioned waste colonization. Um, and I think that's important because, um, and I was just speaking about the, the Basel Convention, right? Trying to dismantle some of this waste colonization. But I think if you look at Boca del Toro, we see this in action. We see um, in real time waste colonization happening. And um, is it possible then that these high GDP countries and people coming from countries with high GDPs and going into countries with lower GDPs, you know, how do we, it, it's already um, in balance, right? The power dynamic is already there. And so when we look at Boca del Toro and we see who's on top, which is a, a, a smaller minority of individuals that are foreign and who's on the bottom, um, and, and also looking at inequities and perspectives of foreigners on local people. Um, it's interesting because sometimes I'm a chameleon in Bogus. People think that I'm from there and especially foreigners. And so when they come up to me and they say, hola. <laughs> and I say, how long should I let this go on? Should I speak English or do I just let this happen? And, and I let it happen. And then at the end, I say, oh, yeah, that's great. No, I, I continue on. Um, but this is the attitude and belief system of some people coming into the region that they know more than locals. And it's very painful to watch because I've seen such a big change over the last eight and a half years. And not only is it influencing the culture um, of local people there, but um, at the presence of, of foreigners, and particularly with regard to waste and governance of waste, um, it's also impacting our ecosystem. I study mangrove ecosystems, habitat complexity of mangroves. I also look at um, cultural value of mangrove ecosystems. And in being in the mangroves over the last eight years, um, which I love, <laughs> uh, the, the waste issue in the mangroves is serious. There are refrigerators, there are all kinds of plastics. Um, we go snorkeling and we see plastics everywhere. And um, in some of that research, we did come up with um, some findings about blame, where you know, if you speak to a group of Afro-Antillanos and Bastimentos, they're going to say, well, the waste is, is due to the indigenous group that's next door and also all the tourists. And if you speak to indigenous locals, um, they're going to say, oh, no, it's definitely the Afroantianos on Bacimentos. And then if you speak to uh, the gringos, <laughs> um, they're going to say, oh, it's definitely the Nobe. They, they're, they're, they're very dirty. This is what they say. Um, and these are, these are often rooted in racist ideals and, and racist sentiment. And um, it's all very interconnected. And then I think with regard are to equity implications, um, you know, it's it, the inequity lies in who gets to participate in recycling, for example, and who gets to be able to afford to remove their waste. And so currently we're having a situation where I've been in, informed that the dump where everything goes and is burned um, on the island is reaching capacity. And so there has been a large effort. Um, to start a recycling center. This has been done through Unidos por Bocas, which is a nonprofit organization that is a, um, it, it's comprised of people both from Bocas and of foreigners. So Unidos por Bocas. And funds were gathered and um, now there is a recycling center, but again, the issue is cost and who gets to partner participate and I will leave it there because I am told that I can't speak anymore but <laughs> but I, I appreciate the time and um really a lot of times in focus people will say ah but it's nuestra cultura it's our culture it's it's ingrained in us we we don't know why we throw it on the ground but we do and I beg to differ I, I really do think that this is a, also a governance issue 
and that um, we really do need to start looking at production and on a small island, understanding um, the ways in which plastics arrive to the island and refusing. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cinda, for uh, that chat on your experiences and perspectives in Bocas. Um, so now I'm going to hand out the mic to Dr. Kobayashi, who's going to talk to us about their perspective and their experiences in Japan. Um, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, Madam Masanori Kobayashi. The Ocean Forest Research Institute of the Sasaka Peace Foundation. I'd like to thank uh, Ricardo and also congratulate uh, Ricardo and Yoshi and uh, all the colleagues who have produced a very inspiring reports to address these inequity issues in the waste and the marine plastic uh, issues. Uh, from our uh, research work that we do in Japan and uh, overseas, particularly Asia and Pacific. We also see these uh, inequity issues uh, with relation with uh, oceans. But uh, just uh, our talks uh, remind me that uh, well, one day I live close to the beach and uh, walking, and uh, one day uh, walking the hot dog. I was also carrying uh, like a bag, and she said, collecting waste uh, while she's also walking a dog. Um, another group of colleagues uh, doing jogging. But uh, not just doing jogging, but they also fix the waste, and it's like a combination of picking waste and exercise that are part of a uh, kind of newly uh, emerging trend in Japan as well. So there are a lot of group of people who are very conscious about this money plus images. But on the other hand, there's another group of people who do not really care. And in the summertime, when we go to the beach, then the tunnels. So waste just discarded. They had a barbecue, they had the picnics, and they don't like a local authority, they don't um, put the waste bit any longer. And encouraging beach goers to take the waste back home. But not many people actually do. So there are lots of uh, times of waste uh, just uh, uh, left on the beach. So now another group of people get together and they started uh, like a uh, uh, some uh, services, they receive the waste uh, with small uh, uh, fees like speed hours, five dollars. They can uh, dispose the waste uh, for the beach goers uh, in exchange of some money. So there are new trends, but I could say that, that there is still uh, some legal policy uh, and institutional discrepancy that still tolerate this kind of inequity. Uh, we haven't uh, banned the use of single-use uh, shopping bags in the supermarket. So I, I also sometimes forget to take it, but uh, when I was having this uh, bag, uh, uh, the gentleman in front of me uh, was just uh, asked if he needed a bag. He said, yes, it was just uh, 20 cents, 30 cents. It doesn't really have much uh, incentives for the people change their behaviors. So this uh, uh, economic incentives and disincentives to change the people's behaviors are not really enough or haven't really come to the stage to see uh, actual changes or difference in the uh, consumer's behavior. Um, I think as she mentioned that this waste issues in the remote island countries, one island, uh, Taketomi Island in Okinawa, uh, they also try to boost the uh, uh, tourism. So one time that uh, they did the uh, ecotourism, mangrove, sea kayaking, and they saw an increase in the tourist business. But then there was a new airport built in the next island, and the people started coming there, but they no longer stay in that uh, Taketomi island. So they, they make a day trip and they come back and they stay in the island called Ishigaki. So what happened was that the uh, uh, Taketomi Island the uh, business people, they complained that they see a lot of tourists visiting, but they never stay. But they leave empty plastic bottles in the island. So this is the uh, uh, cost that the island has to bear. And uh, of course, uh, these uh, southern islands, they also see a short uh, waste 
uh, on the beach, and many of them actually do not have a sign speaking Japanese, but actually has a sign in neighboring countries. So a lot of ways also are uh, uh, shown in the Japanese uh, Southern Island beach, uh, most probably coming from neighboring countries. And what happened is that these waste uh, collected on the beach were not considered as a municipal waste that the local authorities are responsible to dispose. So what happened is that, that they, uh, local authorities, they refused because they are not really municipal waste. So the local people who collect the, the waste as a part of the beach cleaning campaign, they have to pay out of their own pockets to dispose of the collective waste on the beach. So this kind of inequity in terms of sharing the cost of disposing the waste in Ireland is another issue. And um, but of course, this plastic single use is uh, one symbolic uh, aspect, but it's part there that uh, many of the waste found in the ocean are actually discarded fishing and the fishing gears. And uh, these fishing gears Yes, sometimes uh, uh, come from like the neighboring uh, sea areas that are abandoned by the IUU fisheries. So people who are engaged in the illegal and unimported IU uh, unregulated fishing, and uh, they just discard and they have uh, the problems and uh, to dispose this. So we really need you know invest, uh, innovations. We need the changes for the policies uh, to make uh, people's behaviors very different uh, and transformative uh, towards um, uh, achieving this uh, uh, free uh, ocean and the beach and eliminate this inequity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Masanori, for sharing that with us. Um, so I, before we take some questions and close, I want to very, very briefly hand it over to Yoshi once more. And uh, so take it away, Yoshi, please. Thank you very much. So um, I just wanted to just, you know, wrap it up. Um, thank you very much, Cinda. Thank you very much, Masanari. There's two things I want to really emphasize. One is, as we said, this is not a matter of the changing consumer's behavior at all. This is the version of our interest in the policy. So I'm really sorry, but you know, there are some of the things uh, perhaps is important. Of course, the people should be educated, not to throw the plastic in the ocean or in the nature, but that's not really what matters most. They need a bold change, which is reduce the production, which is the most important thing. And then let's not really divert the conversation. The second of all, the, I'm sorry, Mr. Nori, but our findings in our report is it's not really a fisherman who actually makes most of the plastic pollutions. That's again, the diversion of the responsibility we talked about. This is a report uh, that actually claims the most responsibility bears in the industry. And then that's our findings. And then that's pretty much what the data actually calls us. So I have to say, those are very important issue. Of course, there is a discard of gears and everything in the fisheries, uh, which we need to address. Of course, there is a consumer behavior change we need to address, but the main change for the plastic pollution that we really need is to reduce the production. There's nothing else we could do. It's almost similar to the climate change as Jessica Vandenberg, Dr. Jessica Vandenberg points out that we really have to work on the mitigation side. Otherwise, there's not gonna be any future. Just a very incremental change wouldn't really solve this bold issues. And that's we really need to be very courageous to tackle and discuss with this inequity existing in the ocean. So I'll pass it back to you, Ricardo. And thank you very much for our speakers. Uh, thanks, Yoshi. Um, so I'd like to open it up to some questions now, but you know, before I do that, I wanted to thank all our speakers today. And I also wanted to thank uh, Karen, Leah, and Ariel from the Ocean Nexus team who have helped us put this together and worked very hard. And uh, so if anybody has any questions, you know, we have this room for about one or two. Um, yeah, please, let me hand you over the mic. Um, Angela Familia from the Yana Free Foundation. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this really timely and very, very important report. 
um, the nexus of social justice and plastics is one that is often overlooked and is extremely important. And um, as was pointed out, the most important thing is caps on plastic production. What Cinder and, and this gentleman, sorry, um, had explained is that these are the downstream effects and they are terrible and they, they exacerbate um, um, social injustice. Um, however, uh, the one thing that has not been mentioned here is the Global Plastic Pollution Treaty and the negotiations that are taking place. And this report will be extremely important in influencing that. Um, my, my, my question, though, is um, do we have an idea of what Japan's position will be on reducing capping plastic production? Can you state who you're addressing? Sorry. Um, um, I suppose to either Jessica or Yoshisa. So, Jess, Yoshi, uh, did you hear that question? Yes, we did. So, Jess, uh, perhaps we have a Karin Oska who's uh, also of the Miyakojima case, and, and then that was her fieldwork thesis, could potentially talk about it. But um, we are not perfectly sure about where yeah, they're starting from. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yoshi, you're back. We lost you there. For you're, a you're back. Oh, really? Oh. Yes, yes, go, yes. Ahead. Right. go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we're not particularly sure about where Japanese money in plastic uh, policy is going. It's probably most appropriate we ask Dr. Masanori Kobayashi. But at the same time, I must say, if you read our report, um, which includes the case studies from Miyakojima, and this is south out, out the island of Japan, you actually do see the perception of the people and the attitude about plastic money in plastic pollution, even in the island, it's not really just a one um, uh, 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 opinion, um, but yet they actually see these issues very much complex issue because it comes with their economic prosperity or so-called economic prosperity, which has been talked about. So I believe in Japan, a lot of talk is how much of a leaner do we have to be? How much of an economic production, that we, uh, economic benefit we have to keep? And how are we going to do it with buying plastic pollution? And unfortunately, I do not really see the change um, of the focus going into the production at all. I really do still see the change is still focusing on the consumer, focusing on the end users, focusing on the beach cleanings, focusing on um, perhaps corporate social responsibility, which unfortunately haven't really worked. So I really think the, the same as everywhere else, the Japan also needs to just take a further step to consider this is not the technological or solutions, but or consumer behavioral change, but they really need to start talking with the production reduction, which I haven't really seen it much or at all, I have to say. Thank you, uh, Yoshi. I think we're going to take one more question and we have someone online. It's uh, Audrey, please. Audrey, if you could state your question so everyone can hear it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So my name is Audrey Chunzi. I am um, the fisheries and aquaculture expert supporting IFAD project under the oversight of uh, Richard Abira, who is the senior fisheries officer in IFAD. I'm really happy to join this uh, really interesting conversation. And um, I would like to ask um, this question. We all know that marine plastic pollution is a big problem, not just in the ocean, but also at the landing site and villages along the coastal zone. Here in IFAD, we have um, some of our IFAD project and coastal project, and we are exploring opportunities to, especially uh, for the youth to participate in, sorry, this, this problem of, of marine uh, plastic uh, pollution. And one of the activity that tops in, that top in our mind is engaging the youth in plastic uh, waste recycling. So we will be interested to hear from the panelists and the audience on some of the successful experiences with this approach of youth engaging in waste recycling. And uh, we all know that this involves a lot of public uh, good dimension. And uh, is, are there other opportunities to access global funding that can subsidize uh, such community plastic waste recycling? 
activities uh, to make them viable. I, I look forward to read the report. It, it, it's very really interesting. And uh, over to you. Thanks. Uh, go, go ahead, Gershia. I saw you uh, raise your hand there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much. This is just extremely important for us to involve the youth. And, and unfortunately, you know, my attitude towards involving youth is not really to educate them. It's not really to teach them. They know. I mean, especially if they're working and they're living close to the coast. I mean, they've seen it. It's just plastic everywhere. So what I'm trying to do is hoping to tell them, okay, it shouldn't be your responsibility. It should be somebody else's responsibility, responsibility, and you should raise your voice. And that's what's most important for us. And what's most important for me is also through this report. Um, there is, uh, in this report, there is a bunch of people in Washington Coast, which is Seattle, United States, quite affluent place. They do beach cleanings. And then those retired, uh, wonderful people, they do that. And they are actually saying in our report, we're just tired of it. We just keep on picking up every week, every month for the last God knows so many years, just still picking up all the time. And we don't really see the end of it. And then they feel very responsible. They have to pass this ocean to the youth. And then they're really hoping that they're going to create the trigger for everybody to raise a voice, especially not youth. We must not pass the responsibility to youth and then saying something like, okay, there is a hope in the next generation. There is no hope for <laughs> what we are actually doing and what we are we going for. We have to be bold and be honest because that's our responsibility to the youth. So, I admire what you're doing, and I'm very happy. I've been giving a talk everywhere to give you a talk to your youth or, you know, record or something and then send it to you. we got to tell them it's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is learn and raise the voice and be critical about it. So that's what it is. Uh, I don't know much about the funding, but maybe you can just ask those people in, in the meetings. But thank you so much for coming in, and I really admire your work. It's through these experience of recycling, people do understand we got to do something about this non-ending exercise. I think that's most important. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, great. Thank you, uh, Yoshi, and thank you, Audrey, for a great question. Um, so I guess we'll close now. Um, not before, I also thank Andres Cisneros Montemayor, who's our photo person, also yes. Zoom assistant, but also Ocean <laughs> Nexus's deputy director. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and I'll leave you with just one very brief message. And I would say that one very important step to begin to solve the problem is to acknowledge that it exists. So, you know, if you want to include any of the topics that we've talked about here today in your everyday work, or you know, within spaces like this conference. And uh, feel free to reach out to Nexus, Andres, myself, Yoshi, Jess, or any of our speakers today. And uh, we'd be glad to chat. And thanks to everybody that's online and connected with us today. And thanks for our colleagues who woke up real early in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, we'll chat later. Thank you. Thanks everybody that was here today.